this text is uh, such a beautiful one uh, about the ongoing relationship between God and God's people. God has called God's people to come up on the mountaintop to worship God, to have a conversation with God, to be in relationship with God with whom they have a covenant, a, a formal promise to be in relationship with one another. God has declared that God would be their God and God has invited them to be God's people. And this covenant is first made with Abraham. God tells Abraham to just go to a land that he doesn't know, to take all of his people and all of his stuff and all of his things. And God says, I'm going to be your God and I'm, you're going to be my people. I'm promising you land and progeny. And I'm going to just pause there to say that we have talked before about how there can be a problem in chosenness story, right? There can be a problem in God's going to be my God and God, I'm going to be God's people and I get to have the land and you don't. Um, I, I, I will come back to that theme. That's not where I want to stick us today. But I want us to be able to hold intention that these beautiful texts can also sometimes have problematic interpretations especially if my having the land means genocide, and especially if my having the land means you can't have no land, and most especially if my having the land leads to murder and death. I don't think that, I don't think God designs a world in which we have to kill one another to get what's promised to us. Somebody say amen to that. So it just, it just requires some interpretation, right? That's what Midrash is for. That's what sermons are for. So in this place where God has made a promise to Abraham of land and people, now this extended covenant, if you will, is like a promise inside a promise. It's a covenant inside a covenant. It's actually God doing Midrash on God. It's God saying, here, look, let me tell you specifically what I mean about this promise thing. It's that it's not just about your name or your inheritance. It's not an identity about who you be, it's actually a vocation about how you will live. So the invitation is into a calling to be God's people. And the law isn't designed to punish people, the law is designed to actually give people marching orders, boundaries, borders, co like covenant making. This is how it would look to be my people. And God makes this covenant God sets the terms. God isn't saying, tell me what you want, <laughs> you know. God sets the terms. But God is inviting the people to participate in this way. Though God has sent the terms, God is not insisting on participation. The people have a choice. Of whether, whether it wouldn't be this relationship or not. God is not coercing them. God is not lording it over them. God is saying, I love you, come be with me. And the text goes on to say that all the words constitute the covenant. So the words that God says to the people, the words that the people say back. In this way, sometimes scholars say God's a suzerain, which is like God is the boss and the in chargeness, and the people are the serfs, so to speak, meaning, yes, so Mr. Boss Man. But actually, this relationship is like beloved and lover and God yearning for us in a way, God wanting us to want to be with her. Almost like the way in Alice Walker's Color Purple, Suge Avery says, it just wants to be loved and calls God it. So this is what this text is all about. And like any good covenant in the ancient times, there's some blood involved. Uh, like, let's cut some animals and throw some blood around. I don't love that part of the story, but it's in there. And the reason it's in there is because blood is about life. So actually, we're putting our life on the altar. We're putting our life on the altar to be in this relationship with God. So it's sealed in blood. It's sealed in life. Like, blood is dam in Hebrew, and ha-adam is the human one. So all of these words about blood and human belong to the same root, and yet, actually, what makes the covenant stick isn't any burnt offering or any blood thrown. What makes the covenant stick is God. 
God's faithfulness, God's fidelity, God's chesed is the Hebrew word. God is the subject of the covenant, God is the author of the covenant, and God is the keeper of the promises because God is God and, I don't know, we're just people. <laughs> so, so it's obligation. It's God's obligation to be God to us and with us. It's God's obligation to call us in to faithful relationship with God. And so this text is wild in a way. It's like, all right, Moses is gonna, gonna go up on this mountain and at the first level, like any mountain, you know, have y'all been on top of some mountains? Anybody, hills, right? <laughs> so sort of in the low hills are all these people, like Joshua and um, the elders and the 70 people that Vanessa read. All those people kind of on the foothills look up and they can see God. Wow. Like the Bible is all about like no God sightings for you because if you see God, you're going to die. But these people see God, the text says, and they see where God is standing and they see God's presence. It's like an ethical spectacle, right? And then you go further up the mountain and Moses is now with just one other helper. And it's like when you go up in a mountain, there's a cloud, right? There's, no matter, it seems like no matter how clear the day is, when you're walking up a mountain, there's a cloud and you walk through the cloud. So this idea that at some mountain level, at some height, there's a cloud and they see the presence of God in the cloud, the glory of God in the cloud, and then keep up the mountain and now they see the presence of God in fire. So who knows, was that, a, was that a volcano? Was that a fiery sunset? But the images are so beautiful of seeing God's glory present in these sightings. So I wanna point out that it's not just about what God says. Like God says, this is my law, God says you are my people, but there's also something about God showing so that there's a way in which it's both sight and hear that tells God who we are. One writer named Samuel Terrian says, it's the ethical ear and the contemplative eye that can know what God is calling us to. I love that. The, the, the ethical ear and the contemplative eye. But we have to admit, like seeing some fire up on the mountain and that's God, and seeing some cloud and that's God, and seeing God with the big bronze feet and the blue thing he's standing on, that's God, that's God, that stuff stunned the people a bit into silence. Like it might stun us into silence. I had a chance to go visit one of our families the other day. I'm on a visiting family tour, coming your way. Coming to sit with the parents and their children is my Lenten journey. So I started at the home of Jason and Johanna, whose little babies are Maya and Michelle, not, not here today, but um, I baptized them. <coughs> and it seems like the visit is for the parents, but no. It's all about the kids. So we're coloring, we're looking at pictures. And in any visit, the most important thing happens, right, Laura, therapeutic visit, a pastoral visit, in the last five minutes. That's where the real truth comes out. So as Miss Jackie is beginning to put on her boots, Michelle starts making furious sign language at her mother. And her mother's like, and she's like. So ultimately, this ends up with a crayon invitation for me to speak. Dear Reverend Jackie, what does God sound like? Okay then, six and a half year old Michelle. <laughs> no wonder you wanted mommy to write that. What does God sound like? And so I put my boots back off because this is juicy sit at the table with Michelle and make good eye contact with her and I say, sometimes God sounds like the roar of an ocean and her mouth is a little round. But she doesn't quite get that. God is sometimes sounds like a, the roar of, a, of an ocean. Like, she's like, oh, okay. And sometimes God sounds like fire because I've been working on my sermon and here's some fire. Like it might sound like, a, like an earthquake or like a volcano. She's like, Okay, interesting. <laughs> and then I say, but the most exciting thing is that God sounds like you. And this makes a six and a half year old look at me like I've lost my mind. Like, I don't know what you're talking about, Miss Thing. 
And I, and I, so I, so I just lean in more and I say, I'm going to lean on you, Lauren. I lean in more and I say, you know when you say a prayer and you ask God to tell you what to do and then you know what to do? Nod, nod, nod. I say, that's God sounding like you. When you're nice to your friends or really sweet to Maya, that's God sounding like you. She's like, oh, okay, I get that. And I'm like, yes, sermon preached. Let's get up to go. <laughs> middle family, in the middle of this text that gives Cecil B. DeMille a run for his money with sights and sounds and fire and cloud and spectacle and blue footrests for the holy, I want to tell you that God sounds like you. You, not just the six-year-old, but God's glory, God's presence, though sometimes awesome and whoa-making, sometimes God's glory is like the mist on your face when you walk up a mountain. Sometimes God's glory is the way fire smells when it's roasting marshmallows. Sometimes God's glory is you having a deep conversation with somebody in trouble. And God like a female neighbor, because that's what the word glory means, God like a female neighbor shows up in you while you comfort that person who just needs a hug. I'm not sure I say this enough here, because I'm always like, let's march, let's go, let's fix, let's heal, let's trump, trump. You know, that's my sermon. You know what I'm going to say before you get here sometimes, right? <laughs> you think you do. I feel like I want to remind us that sometimes it's kind of soft. Like when your two-year-old granddaughter wakes up sleepy, and doesn't quite know she's at your house, but finds her way in your bed with her, sucking her three fingers. And yes, her snotty nose. But there she is, soft. And the space between me and Ophelia is God's glory. The space between you cooking a good meal, God's glory. Watching nature in Africa, God's glory. Planning the Easter Vigil. God's glory. Penning a song. God's glory. A multiracial cast of fabulousness. God's glory. Somebody coming to visit you in the hospital and bringing you some deacon love. God's glory. Therapeutic interventions in your office. God's glory. Marching for justice. Yes, also God's glory. But sometimes just tender softness. God, softness, because we need some, God's glory. Forgiveness, grace, God's glory. Hope, certainly God's glory. In a crazy world, quiet meditation at the retreat, God's glory. Laughter, God's glory. Good <clears throat> connection with your partner, God's glory. Just go back to Alice Walker. That's why I feel good, okay? God loves all them feelings. Y'all remember that. God's glory. When somebody takes time to ask you, where does it hurt? And you get to tell them because you feel safe. It is just like that. Tender. Like mist on your face. Like a whisper in the ear. And as we begin this Lenten journey, not turning ourselves away from black history, because we're going to do black history every day. <laughs> we can. But on the way to Lent, as we get the fat out, <laughs> I want us to tenderly access the holy and expect to be surprised by it. That what you think isn't God is God. Even, as someone texted me a little while ago, getting your hand cut and getting angry and getting cared for 
this amazing doctor that I'm recruiting for church women. <laughs> Dr. Huff, call me Anthony, was so very good to me after Pam was so very good to me. And Eric, God is in that, in the details, in the softness. All the time, God's glory. One day when the glory comes, it will be ours. So say Common and John Legend, I love that song. But I think today is someday. I think this is someday. This is someday. Raising our kids, loving our partners, healing the world, because we are peace. May it be so.